want to thank everyone here who's come out this evening to attend. And Jack and I want to give a special thanks to all the Zeitgeist members who worked so hard to make this event successful. We deeply appreciate that. I also wanted to mention for those who are new to the Zeitgeist movement and to the Venus Project that all the designs in the film that you just saw were done by Jacques Fresco. <laughs> Unlike the film you just saw, we live in a world where our social systems are old. Our language is old. And the way we acquire goods and services is outdated. Our cities are detrimental to our health, chaotic, and a tremendous waste of energy and resources. And our politicians do not serve us. But our technology is racing forward. We are trying to adjust to the rapid advances in technology with an obsolete value system that no longer works in our technological age. What is needed is a change in our sense of direction and purpose, an alternative vision for a sustainable new world civilization unlike any in the past. This is what we are presenting here, and we call it the Venus Project. And its activist arm was organized by Peter Joseph, and that's called the Zeitgeist Movement. When I refer to sustainability, I'm not referring to sustainability for the banks, corporations, or the outmoded social system that we all live under. By sustainability, I mean the well-being of all people in a new social system, system that would help bring them to their highest potential while protecting and preserving the environment. What I'm talking about is, the, is intelligently managing the Earth's resources by using the methods of science to organize and manage society. I'm not referring to scientists running things, but the methods of science applied to the way we live to achieve a more humane society for everyone. Almost everyone will prefer using scientific methods when it comes to surgery, the building of aircraft, skyscrapers, bridges, and automobiles. Over the centuries, we have developed a consensus that when it comes to matters of personal safety, we choose science and technology rather than primitive belief systems or politics because science has been proven to work. Then why don't we use scientific methods and scales of performance when it comes to planning our societies and our cities? transportation systems, agriculture, healthcare, and so on. If science has a lot to do with what works, then clearly there's much about today's social and economic system that is not scientific, because things aren't working very well for the majority of the world's population or the environment. If they were, war, poverty, hunger, homelessness, and pollution would have been solved years ago. Unfortunately, our social system evolved with no overall global planning or an understanding of what shapes behavior, and these things are not being considered today. The Venus Project wants to, impl wants to apply an intelligent method of planning for planetary survival. If we don't apply the scientific method to the way we live, unnecessary human suffering will continue. We have the technological ability and the resources to feed everyone 
on the planet, but we don't have the money to do so, then how do we even begin to solve our problems within the methods of the monetary system that we all live under? Our practice of rationing resources through monetary methods no longer serves us and ex is extremely detrimental to the well-being of people and the environment. The use of money is hardly ever examined, but let's consider it, along with how much it influences our values and our behavior. Money itself doesn't have any value at all. There's no gold or anything to back it up. It's just a picture on a cheap piece of paper with an agreement among people as to what it can buy. And I would say a forced agreement because we really don't set the prices of things. If it rained $100 bills right now, everyone would be happy except the bankers. So let's look at money. Money is just an interference factor between what we need and what we can get. People think in terms of wanting a job to get the money to fulfill their needs. But if they really thought about it, it's not the job that they want or the money, but access to the necessities of life. The use of money results in social stratification and elitism. They say in America that people are equal, but most people don't drive the kind of car they want or live in the kind of house they want. They live in what they can afford. Many cultures tell their people that they are free, but one is really as free as their purchasing power. How can someone have freedom if they can't get the best medical care or the education for their children? Most people are slaves to jobs that they don't really like, only because they need the money. Many laws are enacted for the benefit of corporations that have the money to lobby or persuade government officials to make laws to serve their own interests. People say that the monetary system produces incentive. This may be true to a very limited extent, but it also produces greed, corruption, crime, war, poverty, and tremendous unnecessary human suffering. We must look at the entire picture. The money system is based on artificial scarcity. For example, food products are sometimes destroyed just to keep the prices up. There's an enormous waste of resources as a result of frequent superficial design changes in order to create continuous markets. This is very evident in the fashion industry. Our social system is based on the need to continuously buy. In this system, you and I are merely consumers. There's a tremendous waste and, and tremendous environmental degradation due to the higher cost of more appropriate waste disposal. The earth is being plundered for profit. But one of the greatest wastes of resources and lives is the military. How shameful it's one of our biggest industries in the world. It's little understood just how much our values are shaped by the monetary system. Our values are influenced by the media for the benefit of the establishment. That means the banks, most churches, the military, and the corporations. For the most part, they determine the public agenda to serve their own self-interests. They perpetuate the illusion that society's values are determined by the ground up. They do this through empty words such as freedom, democracy, and patriotism. What we have all over the world is managed news for the benefit 
of not the people, but the establishment. They produce the books, the newspapers, the TV shows, the movies, education, and entertainment, which in turn helps to shape our values and our behavior mainly to serve their interests. Most important, when the corporation's bottom line is profit, all decisions are made not for the benefit of people or the environment, but primarily for the acquisition of wealth, property, and power. For instance, if your country really cared about you, they would not outsource jobs for lower wages elsewhere. Another example is that industry takes very good care of the production machines, but their employees are often neglected. What if all the money in the world suddenly disappeared? As long as we had arable land, factories, technical personnel, and other resources, we could build anything we wanted to build and fulfill most of our needs. As I mentioned, it's not money that people need, but rather access to the necessities of life. The Venus Project advocates that with today's ingenuity, we could easily overcome scarcity, which is the cause of wars, corruption, and aberrant behavior. We could do this by implementing what the Venus Project calls a resource-based economy. This is a very different concept than anything that has gone before. It's, it has nothing in common with socialism, capitalism, fascism, or communism. To put it simply, a resource-based economy uses resources rather than money. And all people have free access to their needs without money, credit, barter, taxation, or servitude of any kind. All of the Earth's resources are held as the common heritage of all the Earth's people. The real wealth of any nation is not its money, but its resources and the people who are working toward the elimination of scarcity for a more humane society for everyone. If this is still confusing to you, consider this. If a group of people were stranded on an island and they had gold, diamonds, money, but the island had no arable land, no fish, no clean water, their wealth would be irrelevant to their survival. In a resource-based economy, resources are used directly to enhance the lives of all the world's people. If we manage our resources wisely, we could easily produce the necessities of life and provide a very high standard of living for everyone. This may be hard to, uh, to believe or understand, but even the wealthiest of today would have a much higher standard of living within a resource-based economy. When technology and science are unleashed into society to improve the lives of everyone without restrictions of the marketplace or money or patents, it would be a far better world. In the future, children would be taught to be problem solvers instead of the parasitic professions used today within the monetary system that don't contribute anything, anything, excuse me, to the well-being of people. These would be fields such as advertising, insurance, real estate, law, banking, politics, and salespeople, just to name a few. I hope I haven't ups upset too many people with that. When all the Earth's resources are shared, there will be no need for the military. This savage profession could easily be surpassed in a resource-based economy. These people are trained merely to be killing machines. How wonderful it would be if they were trained to be problem solvers and taught how to bridge the difference between nations without violence. This could be done.
When all Earth's resources are managed as the common heritage of all the world's people, the artificial barriers that separate nations would no longer be necessary. Invasions of countries purely for resource theft would be a thing of the past. In the future, instead of fighting one another for scarce resources, people will be working toward problem solving and solving problems that are common to all people, such as the threat of heart disease, cystic fibrosis, tsunamis or hurricanes, and so on. Remember that almost every new concept was ridiculed, rejected, and laughed at when it was first presented, especially by the experts of the times. All new ideas for social betterment, including women's rights, children's rights, child labor, black rights, have always been met with great resistance. During the time of the Wright brothers, distinguished scientists of the day were writing books exclaiming why man can't fly. The Wright brothers didn't read those books and went right ahead and built the flying machine. When science is applied with human and environmental concern, we can easily create abundance for all. We will eventually understand that most criminals that fill our jails are a result of the need to acquire money and property in an age of often contrived scarcity of the monetary system. Children will look back and wonder why we couldn't see the limitations of this offensive system. Thank you. Can you hear me back there all right? Okay. I'm going to say a lot of things, and a lot of things are going to bother you. But during the question period, question the hell out of me. And if I fail to answer your question, say you didn't answer my question. Don't be polite. Because what I've got to talk about is the world today. Politicians say things people like to hear. Everything's going to be all right. There'll be jobs tomorrow. Everything's okay. Theologians or ministers of the church say there's a purpose to everything. Don't worry. The Lord will work things out. We have so much artificially in the world today. They tend you to be honest with your children. Be honest with everybody. Then they tell children that the stalk brings the baby. Then they tell children that Santa Claus brings them things. This is all bull. And you can't build a better world based on lies. In America, you have the Mickey Mouse Club. I think it's come here too. Now, what can you do with that? You fill kids' heads with nonsense, fairy tales, chicken, a world where the chickens talk to people and people talk to chickens and Dickie Dare walks through the field and he says moo moo said the cow ba ba said the sheep well, what can you do with that sort of crap <laughs> you fill the heads with crap like that what do you expect people to do also the worst thing about our present day culture is language the language that you speak was designed hundreds of years ago. Think about it. So I'm going to try to prove to you that your language is artificial. People say to other people, have a nice weekend. Why don't they say, have a nice life? Why just a weekend? So you live in that sort of world where some guy with a white collar comes in and he says, I pronounce you man and wife. Who the hell is he? <laughs> And America, they say, God bless America. Who are you to tell God who to bless? <laughs> what a bunch of pinheads. And then you succeed in electing politicians to political office. Let me tell you what a politician is. He's the guy that says things you like to hear. 
He doesn't know anything. Don't take my word for that. Walk over to any politician and say, how would you stop forest fires? Uh, I don't know. How would you stop automobile accidents? I don't know. How would you do anything? How would you build a bridge between nations in conflict? I don't know. What the hell are they doing there? Really, think about it. They don't know anything. Everything that you have, the electric light, the washing machine, the automobile, the airplane, is technical, not political. I know of no politician in history that ever increased the agricultural yield, that worked on vaccines that saved the lives of people. What have you got in your park and schools? You got cannons in front of your schools, men on horses with rifles, all killing machines. Really, it's an expression of maximum stupidity. Then you've got scientists today, and the government calls on them and says, we'd like an atom bomb. And they say, well, that'll cost a lot. Don't worry about the cost. Build it. And so we put up billions of dollars to make weapons of mass destruction. Our universities today are better equipped than ever, and the wars are getting worse. The old atom bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima, today they're a thousand times as strong. America has 300 submarines. Each one has more destructive power than all the wars in history. Now, what are you going to win with that? Think about it. I'm telling you that politicians are ignorant. They were great a hundred years ago, but today our problems are technical. Let me give you an example of that. When you're driving your car, sometimes it says, be careful, slippery when wet. We would put abrasive in the highway so it's not slippery when wet. When a kid crosses a street, they put up a sign, be careful, school children crossing. Well, we would have a pavement that looks like two combs. And when the kid presses the button, the pavement turns up so no car can hit a kid. Do you understand? Sometimes I meet people that say to me, well, I'm a nature lover. I'm sure you heard that. You mean you like earthquakes, which killed millions of people, hurricanes, Thomas Tsamis, Black Plague, which killed half the Earth's population? That's all natural. So anybody that says they're a nature lover don't know what they're talking about. We like some aspects of nature and some we don't like. Then there's another bullshit word called love. Don't get mad at me. Hear me out. I'm sure most of you don't like everything you've ever done. Because there's things you did in the past that were stupid that you'd never do again. If you live with a duplicate of yourself, how long will you be together? Not very long, she said. <laughs> don't you see that sometimes you like yourself, sometimes you don't, sometimes you hate what you've done, and when you marry, you'll have the same thing. Sometimes you love your husband, and then how do I ever get into this? So it runs. Love is a fluctuating system. It's not fixed. I love you. What the hell does that mean? You can only love certain things about people, just like yourself. You only like certain things about yourself. Not everything. When a guy said, well, didn't you love your mother? I said, in what area? My mother was a racist and a bigot. I did not love her in that area. I brought a Japanese kid home one day. He says, I don't want that kind around. Loud enough for the kid to hear it. He was a friend of mine from California. And he said, so long, Jack, I'll see you later. I used reason with my mother. Let me tell you, it didn't work. I sat down and used logic. Didn't work. I said, Jack, if you can't turn your mother around, how are we going to change the world with all the different values and different social customs? I once asked Einstein, do you believe in God? And he said, which one? There's so many different kinds of God. The Jewish God says, if a man takes your son's eye out, you take his son's eye out. The Christian God says, if a man strikes you, turn the other cheek. The Lord's Prayer says, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no money in heaven, no business, no private ownership. And Larry King once said to me, 
What do you think of Christianity? That's a wonderful idea. When is it going to be put into practice? <laughs> and frankly, I've never met a Christian. A guy that has no locks on his door, that brings the poor in his house and says, can I feed you? What can I do for you? I wish to share my home with you. No more gossip. And it says in the Bible, judge not, lest you be judged. That means don't judge anybody, because you don't know enough about the conditions that made him that way. It also says this in the Bible, there but for the grace of God go I. It could have happened to any one of us. That means if you were brought up in a Nazi culture as a baby, if you never saw anything else, Heil Hitler, Deutschland over alles, Germany above all. And if you're brought up in Italy, Malazzo de Americano. So, so here you have all these different customs. And if you're brought up in Italy, you say, come on, they eat, it's a good food. See, is that inborn? No, that's a dialect between Italian and English. And if you're brought up in France, you talk with your hands. And if you're brought up in the Arab world, you might have ten wives. And if you were all brought up in ancient Rome, the big thing is feeding Christians to lions. The whole Roman family used to come weekends to see Christians being fed to lions. Of course, they starve the lions for a week to put on a good show. Then they take the clothes off the Christians. And the whole family would come. And the kids would say, Daddy, can I come next week to see Christians fed the lion? He'd have you behave yourself. <laughs> Was he insane? Are the kids insane? No. That's normal to that culture. In this culture today, you go to price fights where men punch the brains around in other men. That's normal to this culture. This culture, somebody once asked me whether there'd be horror movies in the future. Just a movie of the present-day world culture will be a horror movie. The Bible says we shall always have the poor amongst us. I reject that. We'll always have wars and rumors of wars. We've always had wars. I reject that. I think humans can solve all the problems if they're given the facts. All nations and all politicians lie. That's their business. They say things people like to hear. In the early days, most people believed the earth was flat. Now, politicians say, would say, listen folks, it's a little round and a little flat, and you get along with more people. The scientists do not speak to win approval. They get up and say, the earth is round. And this is why we've accepted that. They show you the reason for it. Is science perfect? No. It's just a hell of a lot better than politics. Politics solves nothing. You have to get that through your heads. I'm direct. I don't care whether you like what I say or not. That's the only way to change people. Give them an understanding of how the world works. Now, in the very early days, people really didn't know how the world worked. So they pictured some guy up there that made a man and a woman. And then he made a snake that used to walk upright in the old days, according to the Bible. And the snake said, eat of the fruit of knowledge. And so Eve tried it, and he kicked them both out of heaven. Is this an all-loving God that makes a snake, makes a tempter, and makes hell? If you don't follow his teachings, you burn eternally. That sounds more like a psychopath than God. So the gods that man make are more like themselves. A guy that gets angry creates a flood. If that doesn't work, he creates bubonic plague. Killed half the Earth's population. Children, old folks, young folks. Then there's the religious right. If a guy commits an abortion, he's killing a life. And these people will shoot the abortionist. War kills pregnant women, babies, destroy cities. Why don't they get up and stop war? Why just the abortionists? Don't you see the limitations of the mind of people? They haven't got a mind. They're given a mind. When you're very young, you're a Christian. You don't play with that 
You're a Catholic, you don't play with that Lutheran. Then they pump other crap into your head. Who loves you more than anybody in the world? I don't know, your mommy and daddy. And you fill them up with all that crap. What's the greatest country in the world? The good old USA, God's on our side. Well, who the hell are you to tell people whose side God's on? If he made everybody, he couldn't be on anyone's side. So the world you live in is a really very, very sick. And I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm saying it's sad that it's so. Now, if you got mad at the guy next door because he's been a pain in the ass for years, and you shoot him, you get the electric chair or life in jail. If you steal today, if you steal a watch worth $150, and it's your third offense, you might be in jail for four or five years. Well, it's cheaper to give a guy. You know what's that cost? How many watches? 500 watches and more. Give him a watch. Now, why put him in jail? It costs a lot. When you put a person in jail for life, you might as well feed them and educate them. Why put them in jail? I'm trying to tell you how stupid your cultures are. They have no idea of what to do. I'm going to try to give you the answers now. Some of you won't remember it, so write it down. We wish that all the world's people would learn to work together, protect the environment, and take away all the artificial boundaries that separate people. Next thing you have to do is declare the Earth's resources as a common heritage of all the world's people. Well, people got mad at me, say, you want to give people things for nothing, Jack, don't you? Well, here's the answer to that. The fact that you're born in any developed country, you got the telephone, television, radio, automobiles, I don't think any of you guys worked on any of that. You got it just being born here. Does it hurt you? Of course not. Getting things for nothing is what businessmen try to do all the time. They've been doing it for years. They invest money and they get back money for nothing. And money is a nothing thing. It doesn't represent anything. As Roxanne pointed out before, she said that if you were stranded in a boat on an island, you had a lot of money, and there was no water, no fish, and no arable land, you'd have nothing. Money has no value. And what we want to do is do away with money, because today we've arrived at a technological stage where we can make machine guns for soldiers, submarines, aircraft carriers, give them airplanes that cost a billion dollars a piece. How come they only do that in war? Why don't they do that in peace? Send kids to college, take care of the poor, build hospitals for all people. Well, they, have, they don't need money. You have the knowledge to solve problems. It's cavemen that need it that needed that sort of thing. We don't need that sort of thing. Every time we've given a problem to science, we said, can you put a man on the moon? They said, we honestly don't know. And the government said, what do you mean you don't know? Well, we don't know what a man can stand. So they put him in a centrifuge and whirl him around. If he conks out at 10 gravities, that's 10 times force of gravity, you can't launch a ship too fast because it'll kill everybody. So they have to determine how fast a rocket goes off the Earth. Next thing they don't know, how do you give a guy a glass of water in a spaceship? If you pull the glass away fast, the water will remain where it's at. Then it'll form little bubbles. And they didn't know that, so they put water in a tube and you squeeze it in your mouth. You can't know everything. If you're out in space for three months, you lose calcium in your bones. That's why they say, I don't know. Well, you ask scientists, what's the cause of cancer? We don't know. So they go to work and they try to find out. The religious guy said, ye young, ye old, and ye, ye women and men, the children shall suffer for the sins of the parents. That's no answer. The children shall suffer for the sins of the parents. If that was so, would God be just? Why pick it on the poor kids? They didn't do anything. And, and sometimes you have a son or a daughter, seven years old, and they're killed. The men minister says, isn't that wonderful? God gave you that kid for seven years. Isn't that wonderful? Well, how nice. The thing is to make it impossible for automobiles to hit each other. Put proximity gadgets on them. 
If you don't know what that means, today you can drive your car up to the garage and press a button and the door opens. That's a proximity device. You walk over to an area and the light's go on. That's proximity. You could have put that on cars in 1927. So they couldn't hit each other. No politician ever came up with anything. Now here's great George Washington, the first president of the United States, had 300 slaves. Did you know that? George Washington, great man, father of our country. He was a horse's ass. <laughs> like all the other presidents, Truman was a hat salesman. He had a hat store. I don't know if you know that. He was a hat salesman. And Oppenheimer went to visit him and Einstein. And they said, look, now that we got the atom bomb, why don't you drop it off shore about 30 miles away from Japan and say, we have a terrible weapon. We'd rather not use it. We want you to see what we can do. So you better surrender. Now, nah. two men kicked them both out and says, I don't want those guys around me. And he dropped it on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You think the Japanese forgot about that? Do you think any war brings a mindset that looks for peace? No, it doesn't. It builds hatred, cumulative hatred. And people say to me, why are these, this is their language, not mine, why are these goddamn North Koreans working on weapons? Why has China got all these soldiers marching around? Why is China working on rockets? There's a newspaper in England called The Telegraph. And about four years ago, they printed a headline which said, U.S. intends to bomb seven countries, nuclear bomb, sneak attack on seven countries. His name's China, North Korea, that's why they're building bombs. How many of you knew that? Show of hands. Write to the Telegraph in London. They'll send you a copy of it. Don't take my word for anything. How many of you know of memory metals? about 10 hands. There are metals today that remember. They now designed a suture material that doctors use to sew you up with a memory. The doctor ties a surgical knot and he straightens it out and he cuts the skin and he sticks it through and the heat of the body causes a tie a surgical knot. How many of you knew about that? Well, there are fantastic things these memory metals today only remember one thing. But if you cut metal about that long and gave it one memory, then cut other metals and give it different, and welded them all together, you can produce 5,000 or 10,000 memories in one strip. And if you had the memory metal wire, and you bent it in the form of Jesus Christ, straightened it out, put it on a table, and heated the bottom of the table, it'll go back to Jesus Christ. You can build the following. People don't know what's happening in technology. They say there's too many machines in the world today. Well, if I say, I'm coming tomorrow to pick up your washing machine, your oven, your refill. Oh, no, you're not. It's machines that free us from things. Now, some machines take your job away, so people get angry at machines. It isn't the machines you should get angry at. It's the misuse and abuse of technology. If we had a factory in the Venus Project and a new machine came in that did the work of a thousand people, we'd call them all together and say, instead of working eight hours a day, you now work four hours a day. And instead of getting a week off here, you get six weeks off. That's what machines can do, but they don't do that. They downsize. They get rid of you. I'm trying to tell you something, that your country doesn't give a damn about you. They would not outsource to China if they cared. You'd be on the job. They wouldn't sell cigarettes. Cigarettes always, don't get mad at me, they always produce cancer. 15 or 20 years later, you'll have cancer of the lung or cancer or heart disease. Why do governments permit that? Because they get a piece of the action, taxation on cigarettes. Same with liquor, drunk driving kills thousands of people every year. But you can buy cigarettes, especially in this country. In America, they're beginning to decrease the amount of cigarettes available. And they put a warning on it. This may kill you. 
Now, out here, I haven't seen too much of that yet, but it won't be long. Do you ever see, we would never say to people, say no to tobacco or say no to drugs. We're going to show motion pictures of a guy dying who's been smoking for 20 years. We show how he dies and chokes, can't breathe, lung cancer. We show people sitting up, withering away in bed. We show real movies. That's the way you get rid of cigarettes. You don't say, say no to tobacco, say no to drugs. Some asshole president's wife, Ronald Reagan, should say no to drugs. Well, how nice. These are all stupid people out there. We even name airports after Ronald Reagan. He was an asshole. He knew nothing. All of the presidents, including Eisenhower, he warned the American people against the military-industrial complex, but apparently didn't fill it out enough. So right now, they have that. We have air bases all over the world in America. We have submarines anchored all over the ocean. We have detectors in the ocean to detect the positions of all potential enemy submarines. If we use that kind of knowledge that we use in technology and took all the soldiers and taught them to become problem solvers, how to bridge the difference between nations, how to increase agricultural yield, how to bring harmony amongst people, all people need the same thing. Clean air, clean water, a relevant education, good clean agriculture, where you don't spray poisons on plants. You don't engineer plants, food, to grow faster. If you do that, you make the cell multiplication faster. They want to breed chickens fast, so you're going to have to wait three or four months for the chicken to grow up, pump it, and if you pump it, the cells multiply faster, and they wonder why cancer's on the increase. A lot of doctors say, well, we're trying to find the cause of cancer. That's another stupid remark. Like it's trying to find the cause of a criminal. Is it one thing or many interacting variables? My kid came to me one day and said, Daddy, what makes an airplane fly? Is it the propeller? I said, if the engine doesn't turn it, oh, is it the engine? No, if you don't have fuel in that engine, it won't turn. Oh, is it the fuel? No, if you don't have oxygen, the fuel wouldn't combust. Then what is it? Many interacting variables. There's no cause of cancer. There are many interacting variables. Doctors, a lot of them, I've been to a lot of medical lectures. This doctor was lecturing to a group of medical students. He said, we will never be able to graft an arm onto a person. The proper way to say that is I can't conceive of how we might be able to do that. That's honest. Do you think we'll ever build machines that will fly uh, two, three, four, five thousand miles an hour? I don't know. It's not my field. Do you think we'll ever get to Mars? I don't know. I know nothing about rockets. I don't even know how to transport people there. Just say I don't know. But there's a lot of people who walk around and say, you won't see that in a thousand years. Like they've worked all their life on it and studied it. They're just yakking away. And that comes from giving everybody a right to their own opinion. So if she lived across the way from me, and I see 10 guys coming out of her apartment, I can have all kinds of opinions. She can be a language instructor, a ballet instructor, but I got my opinion, and everyone should have a right to their own opinion. Well, in my opinion, you ought not have a right to your own opinion. So, you see, you give people things like that, and they louse up the world. That's what I mean by our language is old. Our language, we talk at each other rather than to one another. In the future, the most difficult thing for people to learn is, I don't know. Will the Venus Project work? If you say yes, what's your basis for it? How are you going to, what do you do with people that don't want to live in the Venus Project? What do you do if two people disagree with the design of a city? Who decides which way you go? What if one engineer wants to build a swept forward wing, another swept back? Who decides what you build? We build swept forward and swept back in every other shape, because we want to know. Person says, I believe in natural medicine, Another guy believes in orthodox medicine. Let's try them all. Why do you have to decide this or that? You have to do that in a money system. When you don't have enough money, you have to decide whether it's this or that. But we have enough resources in the world. Proof of it is the cost of World War II. 
When you think of all the cities that were bombed out, flattened out, 400 ships on the bottom of the sea with copper, iron, aluminum, all the lives lost, all the ships sunk, the military ships, now I'm not talking about freighters, and all the people killed and all the cities destroyed. The cost of World War II could have housed everyone on earth, built hospitals all over the world, and wiped out poverty all over the world. How stupid can you be? Don't you see that the problem is getting along with people, bridging the difference, not killing them? Today, the army has new guns with a laser beam on it. And if the laser beam is on you and you pull the trigger, the bullets come out. If it's not on you, you can pull the trigger till you're blue in the face, no bullets come out. Airplanes fly so fast today. When I was a kid, the pilot would look out of the airplane and say, I'm about a mile high. Today, with Doppler radar, it tells you exactly how high you are. The echo hits the ground, comes back up, and tells you you're 5,300 feet, 40 inches, and so much off the ground. No human can do that. So we want all airplanes equipped with radar. We want all airplanes equipped with CO2 gas tanks in front of the engine. If you're coming in for landing today and the landing gear doesn't come down, the wheel system, if it doesn't come down, the fact that it didn't come down, it blows the fuel out right away. Most people are not killed in airplane crashes. They're killed by fire spilling over the engine. So what do you really want? You don't want the pilot to have to do that, but when the landing gear doesn't come down when he press down, then you want the fuel blown out. But let's say the plane lands and the brakes fail. That plane can crash into people, hangers, and destroy things. What we would do as technicians, when the brakes fail, a net comes up on the runway. I suggested that to the Navy, to put that on aircraft carriers. So if the plane is going to overshoot the deck, the net comes up, and it works. And there are answers to problems, not God give us a safe year, bring everybody back safely. That's called the verbal hobby. When you learn to be technical, you want to know why things happen. Why do nations hate each other? What makes a thief? What's the difference between a thief and a minister? The environment they were brought up, brought up in. If you were brought up by the headhunters of the Amazon as a baby, he'd show me his collection of heads. I got five heads. I said, doesn't that bother you? He says, yes, my brother has ten heads. So is he insane? No. He's brought up in that kind of culture. If any of you were brought up in a different culture, believe me, you'd be different. If all the men and women had a nose a foot long, you'd have surgery done, have your nose extended. So people think that there's such a thing as beauty. They think there's such a thing as truth. I meet people that tell me they're truth seekers. In order to know the truth, you'd have to know everything. Now, here's why there can't be any truth. I once asked Einstein, do you believe in truth? He said, what do you mean by truth? That certain things are so. He said, well, like what? And I said, well, the chromium on my watch, this is smooth. He did me a favor, he put it under a microscope and he blew it up and it looked like that. I thought it was smooth. So I said, is that what it's really like? He said, no. He blew it up again, it looked like slivers. Oh, I said, is that what it's like? He said, no. If you blow it up again, it looks like particles. So we can't see things as they are. We can only see things as our receptors are able to. Some scientists think that man is born with eyes to see. So if they come to visit me, I take them in a dark room and I say, see. You say, I need light. And you don't see with your eyes. You need light. People think that camels have wide hoofs so they won't sink in the sand. That's in all the school books today. They have wide hoofs and they don't sink in the sand. They don't have wide hoofs not to sink in the sand. There is no purpose to life or anything on it. They write in books, the purpose of the eyebrows is to take sweat and bring it off to the side. If that's true, what's the purpose of coughing and sneezing to infect other people?
Don't you see? Go all the way. You'll find when a hurricane comes, it doesn't go over a church or around a church. It blows a church away with all the nuns and everybody else. Nature. Nature doesn't give a damn. When a hurricane comes, it says, well, there's children in that building. And then there's the Gaia people who think that the Earth is some form of connection with living systems. The Earth doesn't give a shit about anything. When an earthquake happens, it shakes all the buildings and kills people all over the place. Lutherans, Catholics, Jews, Swedes. It doesn't discriminate. So our job is to understand nature, how it works, what makes a criminal, what makes a serial killer, and get rid of the conditions that produce aberrant behavior. So I will, at this time, open the questions. So please, try to come to the point, okay? So if you have any questions, please, I welcome you to raise those questions. Uh, I have a question uh, for Jacques. I'm over here at the, your right side. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, you said, I, I agree with uh, most of the things that you said, but you said we have to declare uh, Earth resources our common heritage. How do we do that? Jacques is hard of hearing, so I'm going to be telling him the questions occasionally and answering them too. How do you declare the Earth's resources as the common heritage? Well, that's a very excellent question. First, you have to educate people. Just as when Edison invented the electric light, he had to tell people what he's doing, what, he, what it does. They wouldn't know. The gas company sold gas fixtures, so he had to tell it to them. When Jesus came up with his ideas, he went around speaking to people, and they spoke to other people. If you don't speak to people about the Venus Project, I can assure you nothing will happen. It depends on what you do when you leave here. If you all say, well, that was a very interesting lecture, and you go about your business, nothing will happen. So we first have to educate people as to the world they live in, the errors of our ways, the stupidity of government. If you can't do that, you come at them another way. Years ago I said, Jack, how are you going to change the world if your mother doesn't even like Japanese kids in the house? If you can't change your mother, how are you going to change people? So I used reason with my mother. Didn't work at all. I used logic. I sat down, drew diagrams, didn't work. So I said, boy, you better get to your mother if you're going to try to change the world. So finally I found something that worked. I said, I was swimming in the East River. This isn't true, by the way. And uh, the Japanese kid, Masato Takashigi, threw a lifesaver to me. And I'd be dead if it wasn't for Masato. My mother says, I, gee, I was so cruel to him. I said, yes, you were. She said, please, Jacques, ask him to come back. I'd like to beg forgiveness and thank him for what he did, for saving your life. I said, I don't know if he'll come back now to get her to plead with me more. And she pleaded with me more. So I called Masato and I said, when you come in the door, my mother's going to hug you and bless you and kiss you, because that's her background. That's her reaction. And she wants you to come for dinner and she wants to talk to you and beg forgiveness. He, so I prepared him for that. But my mother was really talking to him at dinner. So I walked out. I came back about 15 or 20 minutes later when Masato went to the washroom. I said, mother, what do you think? She said, you know, he's just like you and I. He's a wonderful human being with wonderful parents in Japan. I said, he's a member of the yellow race. Yes, sir. I said, that's what I'm do with it. He said, he's still a nice boy. I said, man, yeah, but you can't trust those big Japanese. She said to me, oh, he's a fine boy. I can't judge everybody. A month later, she puts a arm around the supper and calls his son. But she really doesn't like him. Then, I said, he never saved my life. She said, you little devil, I will never open the door. <laughs> no, you're not born that way. You're taught to, to hate other people. You're taught those slanty-eyed bastards, the goddamn Germans, are called Krauts. 
That takes away the human aspect. Well, the Germans were stupid, the Arabs are stupid, all governments are. They're all killing machines. And we have to, if we want to live in a world without war, without hatred, without poverty, unemployment, street people, or human suffering, you have to face up to the problems, and those are the problems that I talked about and Roxanne talked about. And if we fail to take on that thing, if we fail to take on responsibility for our own future, others will do our thinking for us. That's you called know, fascism. One Any the, other questions? Excuse me, Jack. One of the things we want to do is a major motion picture because we feel that films get to more people faster and can help change values. Um, in World War II in the United States, they had young Christians that they wanted to get to go and kill, and they had trouble doing that. So they hired Frank Capra to make a film called Why We Fight. And they did these fictitious scenes where they took women who were pregnant, and then they took Chinese Americans and put false teeth on them that Crook. stuck out and crooked and green, and then they bayoneted, bayoneted the, the mother you know, right where the where she was pregnant, and they the enlistment went up 75 percent right away. So we feel we can make films to show people a more constructive direction, and this works better than lectures or any other way. Just like uh, there, you know, we were working in obscurity for 35 years, and it took us meeting one person. Jo Peter Joseph, who did one film, and then within a year we had the movement all over the world. So it really depends on what people do, if they go out and talk to people about this direction and learn more about it so they know how to answer more appropriately, it, it would be very helpful. And we can eventually, you know, no system remains the same. No country can freeze things. They're always in states of change. So this system is falling also. And when it does fall, we would like to have enough people out there to understand this direction to point in a more positive, constructive direction. And that's how you can create common heritage. If enough people understand this direction and we're in a position to work on it, Sometimes to do something. Sometimes people ask me whether the capitalist will give up his factories at all. No, he won't. When Chevy can't compete with Toyota, they go out of business and the government bail them out. They bailed out the banks, all the people that created the problems they gave the money to. What money did they give them? The money for schools, education, to feed the poor, they gave it to the banks. The same bastards that created the problem in the first place. So if you don't understand how money works, there's a tape you can get or a DVD called uh, the, the Money, money Masters. Masters. You ever hear of it? tells you how banks work and how they shaft people. If you really want to know, and if you really want to know how to communicate with people, the book is called Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. Another one, Science and Sanity by Alfred Korzybski. And if you want to know where religion came from, Man and His Gods by Homer W. Smith. The forward is written by Albert Einstein. I can't get those books in the library. There's an organization called the Heritage Foundation, and they re try to remove books from libraries because the books that would rock the boat. I've never appeared on American television, maybe one station, and I can't get on because they feel Fresco is a threat. He attacks the cigarette companies, the drug companies, the people that modify food so that you only have to get their seeds the people that spray poisons on plants. You can design sonic devices to keep insects off plants. You needn't spray poison on. That was known 56 years ago. They still don't do it. So I'm trying to tell you something, that your brain has been filled with crap over the years. Motion pictures, television, all bullshit. And I'm trying to tell you that I didn't, when I was about 21, I wondered what people would be like if they weren't exposed to this kind of education. So I got a job on a boat, and I jumped ship on a, a group of islands called Tuamotu, about a thousand miles east of Tahiti. And when I got there, everybody walked around completely nude. 
And I noticed that the men there never looked at a women's body. They were swimming nude ever since they were this high. And if you gave them a picture of a woman's body, they'd say, I can't see the face. Who is it? They never stared at the tits, legs, or butt, only the eyes. And I wondered, gee, were there any peeping toms on there? No, there's no need for Why? Why? A peeping tom evolves in a culture that covers things. You understand that? So, in the islands, they didn't cover anything. So I wondered how they made love to one another, whether they had fetishes. Of course not. They put their hands on top of the female's head and stroked the whole person. They me like you, but they were no tit men, leg men, ass men, hair men. That's made in this culture. Another very interesting thing about the islanders <coughs> is when you stroke a dog, you stroke the whole dog. You don't stop at the balls, you stroke the whole dog. <laughs> You understand? All right, so people are shaped by culture. If you still don't understand me, if you were brought up in Japan, you'd bow. You know what I mean? If we say, you don't have to bow to me, they still bow. See, that's a reflex, established reflex. Most of your thoughts are not your own. They're thoughts which are generated by motion pictures, novels, plays, the world you live in. I know a girl that was brought up in a home where dad was very mean to mother, extremely mean. He beat her up a lot, and he beat up the daughter a lot, and she came up to me and said, boy, I'm never getting married. Where she's coming from, that makes sense. She's never known anything else. So people turn out to be serial killers, not inborn. It's because of a certain aspect of the environment. And you say, well, how can a serial killer be made by environment? I'm going to tell you that, and you try to figure out the rest of the things. This kid was about seven years old, touching his private parts. And mother was an old-time Baptist. She came and said, you're going to burn in hell touching that body part. That's satanic. She scared the hell out of that kid. And the mother said at two in the morning, he stuck needles in his genitals. He was screaming. And she came in and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I don't want to go to hell, mommy. So he used to take minority kids in the woods and try to cut their genitals off to save them from hell. There is no such thing as a bad person or a good person. Depends on where they're coming from, the kind of environment they lived in. There's a hand up back there. If you don't understand that, raise a question. Uh, it Genetically, all you inherit from the parents is the color of the eyes, the shape of the nose, a propensity toward heart disease, but not greed, prejudice, bigotry. That's learned. I have a question, please. Um, up here on the balcony. Oh, yeah. yes. All right. Uh, my question is about the greed, um, because I didn't understand if, if, if everyone had the, the equal access to all of the resources. Um, but we know from our experience that, for example, when you, when you give someone too much food, he or she overfeeds and so on, uh, how is the notion of greed? Greed, when you give somebody too much food, they overeat. You know, if it, rain, if it rained gold today, people would be pulling it into their closets, they'd be filling their cellars, you know, in their attics. But if it rained gold for 40 days, you'd be sweeping it out. So, It's like asking, what is a glass of water worth? Well, if you're on a raft and a millionaire is dying, you say it'll cost you $50,000. He says, that's outrageous. But two days from then, he says, is that all you want for it? it the value of anything depends on how abundant it is. In Kimberley diamond mines, they burn so many tons of diamonds every year because they're made of carbon that keeps the price up. And if you invented a tire that was good for 20 years, the tire company would buy that tire, but they won't produce it. There's no sense in producing it. You put them out of business. 
You have to think about those things, yes. It looks natural today that people are greedy because they think it's been that way all through history, and it has because we've always lived in a society of scarcity. And scarcity is maintained by using the monetary system, but in the resource-based economy, the job is to produce abundance as quickly as possible. And a lot of the aberrant behavior that you think is normal and inborn would disappear. Thank you. All right, can I give you uh, an example? For example, there are people who are collectors of sport cars, uh, sport cars, right? And they like own hundreds of sport cars. But uh, if everyone has had unlimited access to uh, all kinds of sport cars, some, some people would actually c c collect like thousands of them and that would be a waste. About people who collect, collect things, thousands of things like sports cars. Okay, I can try to answer that. There are people that collect paintings too, oil paintings. They spend millions on very wealthy people. If the Venus Project comes about, we will approach those people and say, you have 40 paintings, original, would you put them on tour so everyone can enjoy them? He says, no, they're mine. We put that in the morning paper. He said, no, they're mine. <laughs> you understand what that will do? He'll be giving out his paintings. In other words, anyone that has anything like that, a collection of automobiles that he's made over the years, and we say, if you let the world enjoy that collection, send it out there, we'll put it on tour. And if he says, no, they're mine, we'll put that in the newspaper too. So you see, it's not difficult to turn people around. I worked on the Arabs, the Klan, and many other groups, alcoholics, uh, drug addicts, and I've turned them around. But I really didn't care whether they stopped using drugs. My main interest was to make them aware socially, and then they had no need for drugs. In other words, I never taught my boy, my little boy, how to read. I used to read to him at night in the bed, and then I, when it got to the most interesting part of the book, I'd close it. Oh. He said, Daddy, what happened then? And I said, look, if you learn to read, you can find out for yourself. <laughs> and so, don't teach kids mathematics. Give them a reason to want to learn it. And teachers don't know that. Teachers use words like, if they spell cat with a K, they say, that's wrong. When you say that's wrong, think about it. There's no information in those words. The kid gets nothing from it. Well, that's not what I told you. That doesn't apply information. When a kid spells cat with a K, A, T, I say very close. It's just the front letter, the K, that we change to C. But if he writes it with a C facing the wrong way, the next time I say much closer, isn't it? Well, if you say wrong, nothing happens. So no information in it. So most of our language has no information in it. And you're brought up that way, and that's how they manipulate you, by keeping you from knowing things. And if you really want to know the answer, there's a book called Science and Sanity by Alfred Korzybski. You can look it up on the website. There's many books called Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. Language and Thought and Action by Hayakawa. I don't want you to take my words for anything, and I want to thank you for coming, and I deeply appreciate all that Jack, you will we do. Take, we can take a lot more questions. We have until, can I, we have about an hour and 20 Can minutes. I just left? Yeah. Okay. Fire Excuse away. me. Excuse me, here, I'm your, I'm waving on your left side, okay. So you, you just mentioned it's easier to turn the kid and the people on your side, but how are you going to turn the politics on your side? Politicians. I couldn't hear that. How are you going to turn the politicians on your side? Politicians on your side. What? How are you going to turn the politicians on your side? When a company fails, when a government fails, governments go bankrupt. Did you know that? Greece, we bailed them out. That's not going to work, by the way. We're going to Greece on one of our tours very soon. And uh, 
when a country fails, it fails. And the whole structure of government fails if the money system fails, if they're not bailed out. If they are bailed out, it delays the failure for another six or eight months, but it still has to face problems. If General Motors fails, if you bail them out, they say, well, we want to stay in business and employ people. Let me see your next car. Let me see your drawings. Is it better than the Toyota? Is it lighter? Is it electrical? Is it lower priced? No, and it won't work. Yeah, so if we don't come up with a better car than the Japanese, it won't work if you bail them out. So there's no society that can fix and freeze its social operation. All things change. Even your computer today. Some people get mad at me. They think, well, gee, some, you want the machines to take over? No, I don't. All the machines control is production and distribution of goods. They do not control people. About nine or ten months ago, machines were able to handle 1,000 trillion bits of information per second. No group of humans can do that. I don't care how smart they are. So I'm telling you something. Government will be replaced. People will be moved out and machines moved in, not a machine takeover. The machines will be assigned the task. Their electrical tentacles will be connected to all industries, all transportation, so you get a whole picture of what's happening in the world. The human brain can handle seven things at one time. Computers can handle a thousand trillion a second. So, is it a machine takeover? You know, in the old days, your mother used to go, or your grandmother used to go to a butcher shop and say, how much is that chicken? The butcher would grab it, say it's about six pounds. And the person buying it say, it looks more like four pounds to me. So they invented a scale. And the scale we trust in most instances. Anyway, the scale is, is science. And the methods of science apply to government. We don't make decisions in the Venus Project. We do a survey of the Earth and all its resources. How much arable land do we have? How much steel? How many factories? How many transport units? And that tells us what the parameters of design are. Today, architects design buildings, put them all over the place, and your traffic can't move anymore. Everybody gets off at 4 o'clock, and you're stuck there with a bunch of cars in front of red lights. So they make automobiles and buses and trolley cars, and they all have to stop at red lights. If you put your transportation unit 30 feet off the ground, it can bypass all the cross lights without having to stop. But all the buses you turn out jam for highways. They have to stop at a red light. So all the cities of the future will have built-in transportation, art centers, music centers, and have a balanced load economy. That means one-seventh of the population is off every day of the week. Your beaches are never crowded. You don't have to build new bridges and highways. Do you understand that? Yes. It's very simple. So maybe it's a better question for you. So how are you going to um, pull out the bankers, you know, the people who work in banks? So how, how are they going to accept your idea? How are you going to pull out the bankers? How are they going to accept your ideas? In the United States today, there are many bank failures. They're failing all over the place. In 1929, the banks failed. But war was... Germany, Japan, Spain pulled us out of that recession, not President Roosevelt. We were pulled out of the recession by war. Now we have wars going on and still in the recession. We've never had that before. There's no way to salvage this system. It's on the way out. If you study any system, they always undergo change. You can't freeze the system and hold it that way. And another person got angry at me and said, uh, do you envision machine takeover? I want to tell you something. Taking over a country is a human attribute. No machine has feelings. They don't want to rule you. If you work your computer Saturday and Sunday, they'll say, hey, give me a day off, will you? I'm tired of working all the time. Computers don't feel. If you took your new laptop, 
and smashed it in front of 40 computers. We're going to get you if it isn't this week or next week, we'll get you. They don't have a gut reaction. Machines have no ambition. They don't want to take over. This is Hollywood crap that you see that gives you those notions. You understand when I say machines don't feel? And why? What Could we make machines feel? We can do this. We can make machines that look perfectly human. And you can say to them, my brother-in-law was killed in an airplane crash, and the eyebrows are moved to the right angle. Say, I'm so sorry to hear that, but they really won't feel anything. They simulate feelings. And some people say, well, if I know that machines really don't feel, I, and if I knew that motion pictures and actors could be generated in the future, if I know they're generated images, I won't feel. Well, Disney draws pictures of Cinderella. She gets hurt and people cry on drawings. So people do identify with images. Don't think that they don't. So will the machines take over? No. There'll be assigned decision-making in areas where they exceed humans. Do you understand that? I have a, a question. Surgeon, a surgeon's hand Sorry. trembles. Ten tremors per second. Today, precision instruments can move one ten thousandth of an inch and do surgery faster than any human being. So I give them about 15 to 20 years, there'll be no doctors, no lawyers, all machine surgery. I don't know if you've updated automation today. They fill hundreds of Coke bottles with a shaft going in all these by one time. And they think, well, can the machine be faster than the designer? It's always faster than the designer. You can't move bottles fast, as fast as machines can. You can't fill them as fast as machines can. So most jobs, if the Venus Project doesn't come into existence, and if we don't kill each other, if we keep installing automation in plants, most people will not have the purchasing power to buy the products turned out, and that's the end of the money system. Whether I do it, whether it's the Venus Project or not, if you understand what I'm saying, if you check the automobile industry, you'll find out there's so many thousand people working there. Today, there's like 40 or 60 people that operate the major equipment. And the automobile is lifted by a machine, and another machine puts the wheels on. And that's happening in all industries, getting rid of people because people might work for six bucks an hour, 20 bucks an hour. Machines work for sometimes 20 cents an hour. And that means we'll stop shipping stuff to China. With the developed automation, they're getting smaller. You got cameras today that have no film in them. It's got a chip in there and you put it in there. And it works for days. Some, and the next year or two, they'll have a year on one chip. Do you understand? So things are getting, are changing. And no one can stop that. If you try to stop the progress in America, China will pass us, Spain will pass us, other countries will pass us. So you got to keep on your toes, keep up with technology. And I'm trying to say this to you, that the answers may be in technical areas. What will people do when machines do everything? They go to art centers, music centers, compose, write plays, shoot movies. We don't even know how the retina becomes detached from the eyes. We don't know enough about heart disease, cystic fibrosis. So all of those things is what people will do. They will say, what will people do? That means the person has nothing up here. There's they don't understand that yes. only you think you want a job only. If you lose your job, your whole world is shot. Boy, they did a good job. Mr. Your, Fresco. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell you, if people were educated, they'd know what to do. There's a question up there. Yeah. Can we just choose a region in the world and make this happen? It doesn't have to be so grandiose. You have something like 500,000 people listening to you. If all these people get together, maybe we can make your vision come true. It doesn't have to be such a huge city. Uh, the whole world situation is crumbling every, every day. I think that we should kind of act in creating your vision and not no, making any can. more movies, we should really get together and make this real. He's talking about under your guidance, that oh. type thing. <clears throat> you want to know whether we can build such a world? Yes, we can if enough people want it. But if they decide that they don't like the Venus Project, for whatever reasons, 
A lot of people picture a lot of men in gray. You will work in Area D. You, Area K. That's Hollywood. It has nothing to do with the world I'm talking about. We're interested in you. What do you want to study? What school would you like to go to? We make it available to you. We don't sell anything anymore. We make books available, laptops to everyone, because the smarter people are, the richer the world. The more deprived they are of information, like when you had slaves in America, you couldn't teach them to read. You were fined if you did that. Because once you teach people to read, they begin to ask new questions, and you can't manipulate them. If we had a free society, you wouldn't have a Democrat and Republican party. You'd have 4,000 different parties. So you live in a world that's very rigidly rigged. If you don't understand that, listen to any politician. We would build the city now if we had the land and we had the resources to do that with, but we don't at this time. But we're working towards it. He's got his hand up. What do we do with the old, with the old cities, with the old monuments, with the old bridges? What would we do with the old cities? Would we build new cities? What happens to the old cities? Okay. Do we preserve them as historical? He's asking a question. I'm what asking a question in the middle, in the, the back. old cities? We will level them and mine them for glass and other things. They cost too much to operate. They don't work, traffic jams. It's cheaper to level old cities. Just keep a few of them as museum cities so the kids of the, Which the future ones? will know what life used to be like. That's about all. Which ones do we keep? They're not worth preserving. But which ones are exactly. worth preserving? Which ones would you preserve? We level 90% of the cities, but before we level them, before we level them, we'll do a study of the gain of a new design. When we're through with that, we bring in another team that gives us the negative effects of cities. In other words, if we design the dam to give enough people water, that's one group of people. Then we have another group called the Special Contingencies Department. They come over and tell us, if you build a dam here, five years from now, the water table is going to change because you cut out the tributaries. And the beavers will stop building dams. That's going to change the water table. Plants will begin to die on the mountainside. They can extrapolate five to 10 years in advance of what will happen if anything you do. And today, we build cities right over the land. In the future, it takes nature a thousand years to make one inch of topsoil. So we shave off the topsoil first, put it in soil banks. People don't even know what's valuable today. Let's say we kill each other in nuclear war. And people come from another world and they want to know what we were like. The only place they go are banks to stack thick. And what have they got in there? Dollar bills, twenty dollar bills. Nothing on the history of medicine, science, knowledge should be stored in banks. They're the most secure position. All they got there is certificates of debt. How stupid a civilization we have. It should be the history of medicine, engineering, agriculture, everything that's essential should be stored in banks. I have a question. Um, how close are you to building an experimental city? And secondly, uh, if political decisions are decisions which concern all people, then the Venus Project is indeed political. So what do you want to do? Do you want to put the scientists in power? You want the first... How far are we from, from building a first city? We could have built it in 1927. That's up to what people know. If they don't know, nothing happens. In other words, if you said, uh, go ahead, build that city, and the population agreed with that, we can do it. But if people don't know about it, they wouldn't follow your suggestion. So it's up to us to get this information out there, talk to people. Concerning your second question, the Venus Project has a particular agenda and a particular, it was particular areas that we want to do in, in well, it's been planned out in, in all areas, in city planning, worked on the methods of how to make people and children creative, 
We had that worked out already. It's not scientists that would run things, because they're just as prejudiced and been just as propagandized as anyone else in this system. It would be people who understand this direction. That's our safeguard in the future, as, as many people understand this direction as possible. And those people who understand this direction follow out the, the direction and the procedures of the Venus Project. And people in the scientific fields would be assigned First, there would be a survey. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be Fresco telling you what to do. The survey, we'd find out how much arable land we have, where, um, where the diseases are, where the technical personnel are, you know, many, many different things, and that dictates how we build, how big the cities are in certain areas, how many hospitals we need in certain areas, and whether we could even build in certain areas. So it's not a group of people telling people what to do. It's based on the needs of people and what, what the survey tells us. And it's like an airline. If you have uh, passengers, say, sick, 300 passengers, that tells them how much food and water they need. You can't fill that airline with 800 people if the wing area is just so much. I worked in the aircraft industry and I found out in working there that we used to figure the wing loading as 24 pounds per square foot. After that calculation, we piled sandbags on the wing until it broke off and it broke off at 27, 28 pounds. We said, that's good. I love that system. Then when they finished an airplane, they pulled it up to about 30 feet off the ground and cut the strings holding it to see if the landing gear holds up. I love that system. I don't like what do you think, what do you think, what's your opinion. I like the testing field. It's wonderful. At least it gives us a closer approximation of reality. And no one, no one can, can define words like the truth. And people believe there is such a thing as a truth. I just want to tell you that truth, there's radio waves going right through this room now. You don't see them. There's bacteria all over this table. You don't see them. So you invent a microscope, the electron microscope, and that's extensions of human systems. All machines are extensions of human attributes. He says, I don't like machines. Well. I don't know what they're talking about unless they mention something specific. But remember, in New York City, there's a subway station, and it's crowded with people, and they push and shove, and sometimes people fall on the tracks. Every airport today has a wall, and when the train comes up, the wall doors open. You can't look down an elevator shaft, see if the elevator is coming. You can't look up, there's a wall there, and the doors don't open until the elevator is right in line with those doors. That's what I'm talking about. Our problems are technical, and senators and politicians can't handle that. The idea of truth is something like there's a fixed end goal. We find it and that's it. Well, this system that we live under today is a, is a fixed system. The resource-based economy is an emergent system. We're always looking for not the truth, but closer approximations to the real world or reality. And it would always be changing. We'd always be learning new things and trying new things. Today, and we'd be teaching kids and people how to adjust to change. Today, people are very afraid of change. It threatens them. Thank you. Any other questions? If I, if I may ask a question about the language, I'm on the balcony on the top. Uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit about the language that you are talking about, because you always say that we have to evolve the language in the direction in which uh, opinions or quarrels and arguments are not possible. But there are fields of language and fields of knowledge like emotion, love, which are very prone to uh, subjectivity. So could you elaborate on that? How do you see language development in those areas? In the fields of love and emotion. Okay. First of all, the word love was invented a long time ago. They're trying to talk about some aspect of human behavior. 
So if a girl goes to a movie and she sees a tall guy with blonde waving hair, always a nice guy, and a short guy or a fat guy is not nice, or the guy with a crooked nose beats some people, she always looks for a guy that she saw in the movies. You see, the future, if you marry a very good-looking guy or you marry a beautiful girl, if she turns to be a horrible person, that face becomes ugly. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So your concepts of beauty, when a guy has a bone through his nose, somewhere in Africa, the girl says, he's a doll, you know? Or if they have big plate lips, you bangy people. The guy gets down on his knees, he says, I love you, your hair, your eyes, your big lips. You know, all that's learned. So the movies of the future, instead of the word love, they show extensionality. That means, if you met a guy with, from another planet with six arms, you go, Ugh. Actually, you say, what do you do with six arms? I can eat soup, pet my dog, say goodbye to my friends, and scratch my back. So we don't ask those questions. We go, eh. Today, girls collect spiders. When I was a kid, we used to throw spiders at girls. They go, eh. You see, so our attitudes, our education be so different, our little kids would not say, I want a balloon, Daddy. They're boring as shit, kids. They have nothing new to say, nor can they say anything new. But you're brought up to want kids. If you really love kids, you'd notice most adults talking and playing with kids all the time, but they don't. So they have their own kids, and you have to wipe their ass, send them to school, pack lunch, you can't go anywhere, the kid's too young. Well, that's because you have limited options. In the future, the options will be limitless. And anybody that wants four or five kids, sometimes a person comes over to me and says, I have six kids. I say, what are they for? You understand. When you have children, you try to make them smarter and better than you are. Uh -huh. That's what the job is. When my little girl was three years old, she came into my lab. She just walked in one day. And I put a wrench on the nut the wrong way, intentionally. And I'm trying to turn it. I put her on the wrong way again. She put her little hands on it and said, Daddy, that's no way to do it. So I put her on the wrong way again. She said, I'll have to show you. So she put it on the right way. The reason I did that is because I wanted her to scan things, not look up at her daddy. Daddy knows everything. I wanted her to look at a situation. Sometimes I'd build a miniature bridge and I'd leave out a certain part that was obvious. She said, Daddy, that bridge isn't going to work. I said, why not? You didn't put in the braces here. Oh, thank you very much. Invite participation of your kids. If you sometimes ask them for advice. I come running in the house and say, what did you bring me to my little girl? She says, I'm too little to bring you anything. So you, do, you try inviting participation, share ideas with your kids, invite them to think. Schools of the future will be very different. In fact, somebody once asked me, will there be horror movies in the future? I says, any movie about any present day society will be a horror movie. We're going to take a 10-minute break and be back here at uh, quarter after and continue with questions. Okay. okay.